जर्नलिज्म and we have three uh, three uh, uh, participants myself moderating so i guess we need to jump right in uh, firstly my personal definition of long form journalism simply long write ups that have a mix of intense in depth reportage packaged in literary or semi literary style including opinions that the reporter has come to uh own as a result of his or her reporting so it's one is of course long two is in depth reporting and three is uh, some kind of opinion either given directly or indirectly now this is just my definition just because i needed to set the stage somewhat i personally consider myself a reporter more than an editor and i've always missed in these years of editing the thrill of doing long form journalism through reportage i remember the last time i might actually say i myself did one uh, long form reporting and journalism was um way back in 1990 july august an article titled um, uh, the dragon bites its tail about the um, the bhutanese refugees or the making of the lotsampa bhutanese refugees back in 1992 july august so with that a uh, bit of a background and my own sense of the excitement of the world of long form journalism and uh, lucky the reporter who is given such an assignment because it means you have time it means also you have pages time to report and pages to fill no reporter could ask for more and that is why this topic is so important <clears throat> and uh, in the nepali context what to call it <clears throat> you don't need to necessarily give any any topic a title for it to be important nevertheless given that in english there is something known as long form journalism <coughs> what could it be in nepali talking to a couple of friends jugal burtel and hari sharma ji before coming up here we came to the conclusion maybe one suggestion for long form journalism <coughs> could be alekh patrakarita Although Hari ji also suggested that maybe it could also be called Liang Thang Patrakarita. You know, and again Liang Thang Garada si phere chai na na khali kura thupar deo and thupare pasi chai ni long form manne pani bhayo. So let us say therefore then there are two types of because long form itself just because it is long doesn't mean it is good. It can be Liang Thang or it could be Alek. And I am proud to present to you before you today. three gentlemen who are of the alekh variety um langfeng is a nepali onomatopoeia nepali as a language is rich in onomatopoeia langfeng means anything goes just dump it in there make it long and make it work as so called long form journalism but i am crediting the three of you for being um long form journalists in the proper sense of the word we have matthew akins uh, who is from halifax in the eastern edge of canada uh he has reported afghanistan since 2008 and some of you you would have heard him in conversation with anoita mojumdar yesterday and he has written stories on um, foreign aid in afghanistan the military strategy of the us and nato human rights violations by all sides in afghanistan we've got hartosh singh bal uh he comes from a village outside amritsar 
he was uh, till recently with Open Magazine, and although I don't think uh, I don't think we'll have time to get into it here, but f the circumstances in which he moved from Open Magazine to Caravan might be uh, the topic of a separate discussion because it is related in some ways to the political turbulence uh, associated with, if you will, the arrival of Mr. Modi. Um, but we probably will not have time to get into that unless Sartos uh, finds a way to answer a question that leads us in that direction. And then we have Ravi Thapa, who is a journalist, uh, also a editor of a literary journal here in Kathmandu, Lalit, and uh, a, a literary guy fast converting into a literateur before long, if you know what that means. Uh, let me start with, uh, with um, Ravi then. Uh, I'll ask, because we have little time and I actually have already taken more time than I thought I should, I would ask the organizers to see if the children having a very good time next door could be asked to quieten down just a bit. Okay, Ravi, I wanted to start with asking you a question. Um, I mentioned earlier that long form includes, by definition, for me, uh, literary style. Uh, just your reaction to that statement of mine. Well, I should uh, probably put in a disclaimer there because I don't really consider myself a journalist, mm -hmm. more of an editor and a, and a writer. But I mean, the, the, the whole notion of long form is obviously it's a, lot, it's a lot of discussion about the, the definitions, you know, whether it's journalism, whether it's more literary and all that. And a couple of weeks ago, I was, having a, I was, I was talking to a taxi driver and he was asking me, so what do you do? I was like, well, I write, I write novels and short stories. And, and he was like, why? You know, why would anybody, anybody be interested in that? I was like, because it gives you a bit more of a, an in-depth kind of, it's not like just watching a singing, dancing movie. You, you, get, to, you, get, to, you get a more multi hued kind of exploration of what it is. And it's also enjoyable to read because of the way in which it's written. It's not just stage directions. You actually you know, get to see probably the private, the private side of, of public events. So I think that's where, that's where the, the literary side can probably come in. Okay. And uh, working with, with writers uh, contributing to Lalit, the literary magazine, I'm finding that it's, it's, it's actually quite difficult to define for the benefit of the journalists what exactly we want. Because either we get stuff that is too literary, very imaginative, but doesn't really have the journalistic side of things, mm. or we get things which are just plain, plain unadorned journalism. So it's just like news reporting, and that's not very interesting mm. for us, for, for Lalit at least. And I, I was talking to Matthew yesterday about uh, Shah of Shahs, the book by Richard Kapuscinski, and Lalit translated uh, two excerpts from, from this book. <coughs> And for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, Shah Shah's is obviously it's an account of the, the Iranian Revolution, so the events of that time of the of the of the late 70s, and and going back even before before that. And it's written, it's written in a very literary style, to say the least. The so Kapuscinski is basically riffing off photographs, notes, and Matthew was insisting that if somebody like Kapuscinski wrote that today, it probably would not be accepted as journalism. It's proved very controversial because. I mean, from Matthew's point of, point of view, at least, it's very, it's more literary than, gen, gen, than, than journalistic, probably. And from, um, from, from my perspective, as more of a literary person, I thought the book was amazing. But mm. yes, there are probably some, some, some serious journalistic flaws, mm. flaws in that. So it's, it's a question of balancing the literary and the journalistic. Mm. And I probably have a bias towards the literary. So it's something that I, I would need to correct. I need to correct even as I work, work on particular stories. I think you certainly have a bias toward literacy, literary pursuits because you try to uh, shake off this journalistic tag very quickly while conceding that you are an editor. And if I recall, you did work in a certain tabloid news, weekly newspaper in English. I did, and but interestingly enough, uh, 
that that newspaper was well known for its short form journalism. <laughs> it was okay. kind of it was kind of frustrating to have to have to com compress everything to 600 words. Yeah, that's probably why I don't write for it. Uh, let me let me uh, move on to Mike uh, uh, Matthew Akins. Uh, you work out of Afghanistan. Let's try to meld, meld the two topics together. Long-form journalism, Afghanistan. From the outside, what we see is so much coverage of Afghanistan. Certainly the New Yorker, the Atlantic, uh, the various publications out of Europe that do long-form, they would have covered Afghanistan. And the idea being that long-form allows you to get to the, the gut of the issue. Has it actually happened? In fact, Afghanistan is a great... Uh, testing ground to see whether long-form journalism fulfills its promise of bringing out the, the reality of a society in conflict turmoil or just uh, a society just going along as it is. Well, it, it's an interesting question because despite all the journalism that, that has been written, whether long-form or short-form or otherwise, about Afghanistan, uh, to which I've contributed uh, my share, it doesn't seem like we're doing that well in the policy score because things are sort of careening from crisis to crisis and disaster to disaster, and people don't seem to have much of an idea of what to do about the situation there. Um, though before, before I go on, I should just say that I, I'm a big fan of Kapuscinski too. I think one problem with Kapuscinski, um, potential problem, is that it gives you the idea that um, literary uh, techniques and factuality are necessarily in conflict, or that you should have to compromise on a scrupulous adherence to the facts that, that what you're describing actually happened, you know, um, in order to to use these kinds of literary styles, and that's not true. There's there's a lot of journalism that's being done today um, that is very literary that uses techniques that you would associate with narrative fiction, um, but that is held to you know the contemporary standard that of, of, of factuality and that is checked by fact checkers. Now, getting back to Afghanistan, I think that one of the things that I try to accomplish with long form that, that I think that long form long form can accomplish particularly in a situation of foreign reporting, is that it allows you to develop characters and worlds that are quite dramatically different from the one um, that the audience is familiar with. So we're talking about North American readers who live in the, the orderly and peaceful confines um, of, of Europe and North America. To describe to them what life is like for an Afghan person is very difficult. In fact, it's almost... It's essentially impossible, but you can, uh, you can get closer by developing someone as a character, by showing the details of their lives, many of the small subtle things that actually add up to quite significant um, differences in worldview, uh, in understandings of, of how the world works, of, of the kind of pressures and fears that people live in in those situations. And I think you can make a, a, a very foreign, perhaps even exotic subject matter to people emotionally and perhaps morally in a way that um, you may not be able to accomplish with factual stories. We're overwhelmed every day with stories of horror from around the world in the newspapers. But we, and we become a nerd to it, so perhaps sometimes a really moving long-form story with characters that come to matter to us through that narrative can crack through that shell a little bit. And, and that's what I hope sometimes long form can and has accomplished in Afghanistan. But how, how much has it done in the case of Afghanistan in terms of uh, yeah, the format is there, the, the, the shape is there, but has it actually, you said earlier, the indeed that for all the coverage Afghanistan has received, uh, Afghanistan is still not understood enough. Uh, so has long form lived up to its promise? Have you written many long form articles out of Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I write entirely uh, long form articles okay. and then I tweet. So sort of the yeah. long and the short of it. Uh. But I, um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, you, you can't really expect journalism to change the world. It's, mm. it's pretty arrogant to do so. And so I can be satisfied with the response that I sometimes get from readers who tell me that the, your story was moving. I really cared about the characters in this piece. I'm really sorry that this happened to them, that these civilians were killed, that they found themselves in such awful situations. And I guess that's all you can hope for. Quick, quick question then. For all that effort, do you sometimes wish that your... Afghan subjects would have access in their languages to what you have written about them, and what might their reaction be? Uh, th that's a very that's a very interesting question. What your relationship, particularly of accountability, is to subjects who don't share the same language um, as you. But I can say, you know, it, it is among one of my um, pleasures that a couple of my 
articles have been translated, one into, into Dari and one into Pashto, by, uh, by Afghan journalists who, who wanted to make them accessible to an Afghan readers. I don't think I got any royalties off it, but um, that, that was, you know, that was, a, that was quite, it made, it made me very happy to, for that to happen. Okay. Let me move on to Hartosh. Uh, I thought I would ask you, uh, Hartosh, that uh, between the, the diesel uh, combustion engines out there and the children back there, I, I hope you're not getting all that noise that we are getting on the stage. I hope the sound system there is okay. Um, Hartos, I, I, was, I thought you might want to share with us just something fresh off the pan, so to speak. What are the stories that you've assigned recently uh, and printed, published, edited, etc. in uh, Caravan, which gives us a sense of what the editors of Caravan, especially you as the political editor, uh, think are, uh, are the key issues that is uh, animating this huge country to the south? Uh, see, there are some basic questions that come up when we are talking. Caravan is a monthly. Uh, so the question of politics and news and how you interact with this means that either you have to have some sense of how events are going to unfold, uh, you bring in some new perspectives. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, earlier this year, just before the Modi elections, the cover story was on the RSS. And the story was on how the RSS uh, managed to convince the rest of the BJP to fall behind Modi. And it was a very detailed, very interesting story. And it was timed just right because it was clear Modi was going to win that election. The RSS was a crucial factor in that election. The reporting was in depth. Mm. A lot of work had been done. In the same issue, I had done a piece which was looking at uh, Operation Blue Star, which uh, maybe okay. some people, which is. 30 years ago, the Indian Army had gone into the holiest Sikh shrine, uh, the Golden Temple. And this operation had been ordered by Indira Gandhi. It led to her assassination. There were riots in Delhi, uh, the massacre of Sikhs. And the question then arises is that, what is it that you can bring to such a material, apart from the fact that there's an entire generation mm. that has grown up without knowledge of these facts? But you do find that 30 years later, when you're going back to this, spending time on the subject, that people removed from the immediacy of the event are actually now willing to talk back, uh, okay. say things that they may not have been willing to say right then and there. And I had the feeling that we actually got more out on what really happened at that point of time than had been known till now. And that was because people felt at a certain ease removed from the immediacy of the event to reflect on it, to speak about it. It takes time, it takes effort, and then of course it needs the crafting that it is compelling to read. And I, so there is no set formula that allows you to decide what you should be doing, what you should not be doing. You look around, you see, you bring your experience to the table, and then you try and decide what works. And sometimes you get it wrong as well. I mean, that, that's that what you take us right into the, the story that you did, actually. What did you find uh, that uh, so many, uh, three decades later, the participants or the observers, what were they willing to say what they were not back then? Vis-a-vis -vis the Punjab militants or vis-a-vis -vis the Indian state? Or both? Well, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Indian state. I mean, for example, we found that uh, the involvement of Indra Gandhi's son, Rajiv Gandhi, and his close advisors, Arun Nehru and Arun Singh, was uh, far more, uh, they were far more actively involved than one had anticipated. Not only were they far more actively involved, these were people who were actually thinking in terms of the election due later that year. They had in their mind the Bangladesh victory that had won Indira Gandhi an election or had won her popularity that part of the process or the thinking behind Operation Blue Star was a quick surgical strike yeah. that would help them win an election. Yeah. So there was an element of cynical calculation spelt out by people in the party, which we were not aware of at that point of time. It had always been pitched as an event that was forced on the government, but clearly it does not seem forced in its timing. There is an element of cynical calculation. And though that event had such a dramatic impact on how the subsequent history of India has unfolded that, I mean, to know that now about this does change our perspective. Do you think some of your uh, uh, reporter colleagues in Delhi or elsewhere in India are envious of the space and the time that you get to, to delve into something not as a news report but something as an essay uh, from 30 years ago 
and to set the tone to how people perceive that historical event. I mean, is there some kind of envy among your colleagues? I, I think all journalists would want an opportunity like this. I, I would envy myself. I, two years ago, if I'd been told I'd have this opportunity, I would have envied myself. So I think that's a given. Okay. Uh, let's go, go on to Ravi. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier on the Afghanistan issue about uh, what in India is known as language journalism. Uh, here in Nepal, we don't really have a problem with using the term vernacular. Uh, you're also, you carry translations also in, uh, in Lalit. And uh, also, you may have looked at the landscape in Nepal where uh, the Nepali language uh, rules more than, than does English. So, how often do, do you come across long form Alek Patrakarita in Nepal? Well, in my experience, I mean, and, and I can't claim to have done my research as well as I could probably, I don't see that much long-form journalism in Nepali around. I mean, it depends also on, in terms of length, what you define it as, whether you're yeah. talking about 1,500 words as being long-form. It isn't, in my opinion. But it might be longer than wh what a lot of people get the opportunity to write mm. in their respective papers. But I mean, in terms of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 plus, I don't really see it happening. I mean, in, in English at least, I know that Himal publishes some long-form journalism. We have done some. We have tried to translate some uh, Nepali pieces into English and English pieces into Nepali, including the Kapuscinski thing. Uh, I mean, the only real, the only piece that I, that I have come across which met the definition would probably be, which I, I think it came out in Caravan a couple of years ago. It was Deepak Adhikari's piece on, on Pachanda. Uh, I think that was a, maybe about 10,000 words or something, and it, and it seemed to kind of follow the, seemed to have a mix of what we've been talking about. But I, I, don't, I, I don't really come, up, come across it very much, and uh, it's not for lack of having an idea of having the desire to do it. Uh, I mean, you know, even in the last elections, we were thinking it would be how, how great it might be to embed journalists into various, into the three or four political parties and have them follow the cadres and see what they do and come up with a, kind of a combined story about that. It didn't happen right. for a number of reasons, but I mean, it's, it's, more, it's more a question of finding the funding for it and finding the people who, who, can, actually, who can actually carry it out. Yeah. I think that's, that's, I don't think people, I don't think a lot of journalists here have a training, training for long-form journalism, if that's even available anywhere. And to combine that with the literary sense of things, I mean, is so far has proven very difficult in Nepal. I think, uh, uh, we go a little deeper into the training or what is required to do long-form journalism. In fact, uh, in a way, we are, of course, using a term. It can be defined in so many different ways, long-form. But uh, two things that uh, Ravi alluded to. One is the economics. We'll come to that in a while. But in the meantime, what, given that I think this is probably the first time long-form journalism as a topic is being discussed uh, in a stage here in Kathmandu, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe it's, we should go a little deeper into that, given that the suggestion that Ravi made that perhaps uh, one is the economics, one is the lack of skill set to do this. Of course, people do write books very competently. Uh, those, those are full length uh, uh, journalism, let's call it that, if not long form. So uh, what do you, uh, how do you re react, Matthew, that there are certain specific skills that are required to do long form as you do, rather than do a report in a daily or a weekly? Sure, well, I, I mean, long form is a bit of uh, a slippery term, so let me make a further distinction. R rather than length, I think what, a point to make is, is the use of literary techniques. Um, so having character, having narrative, um, the kind of, it's, it is reporting, but it, it, it's often about very mundane subjects, like a lobster festival in Maine or something, that somehow illuminates the, the larger condition, or, or doesn't, is, is perhaps just entertaining. So that kind of journalism, it, actually, I, I would argue, until very recently, was almost an entirely American phenomenon. It didn't even exist in the, in the UK. I mean, name me one magazine that you could say is similar to the New Yorker, or, or The Atlantic, and that it ha really had literary journalism. You had places like Prospect Fine, but they were more home to essays or very straightforwardly reported pieces, which 
in my opinion, at least don't really lend themselves to being that long. I mean, it gets a bit dry after 4,000, 3,000 words, and they weren't really over that. Whereas you can read David Grand's piece on discovering uh, a, a lost city in the Amazon jungle, and it goes on for 15,000 words. And when you look up for it, you realize that three hours have passed, and, and you were hardly aware because it's, it has a spellbinding literary technique. So what we're witnessing today, I think partially because of the internet, is uh, an expansion of this into India, of course. The caravan is, has um, played a leading role uh, in, in, in developing this kind of literary nonfiction uh, scene. Um, now The Guardian has a long form section in, in London. Uh, it, it, it's, it is spreading and I think there's interest in it. And again, it's related to the internet in ways that we perhaps can discuss later. Um, but the interesting thing is that it doesn't, it does require its own skill set. And I know this is something that um, a friend of mine, Jonathan Shannon, who had been uh, an editor at, at The Caravan, and I think was crucial to its development of a certain style that was re reflective of, of Jonathan's background in the East Coast literary magazines. He'd been a fact checker at The New Yorker. Um, that he wrestled with because you had some very good reporters and writers, but training them to write in this literary style um, took some effort. And, and I think he, he accomplished it remarkably well, not just him, other editors and, and writers. And what you see now is a vibrant and growing uh, strain of, of literary nonfiction journalism, that's quite a tongue twister, in, in India. I'm, I'm glad you use the term literary nonfiction. Indeed, that's what we're talking about, uh, using long form as almost like a synonym. Uh, you mentioned the New Yorker, and yeah, that seems to be the template, uh, or at least the beginnings of this type of journalism in the modern era. A lot of us have taken from it uh, in Himal too, in the original magazine format. The idea was to use uh, literary nonfiction, but perhaps pick up issues that are right up there, up against you political topics, but then go in depth with them. Whereas you can also go with topics that are non-political uh, and uh, go into delve into the quote-unquote human condition through that. Uh, to Hartosh, I know that uh, the editor of Caravan also was impressed by the New Yorker d during his time at the Columbia School of Journalism, came back and, uh, and uh, got this started as far as I recall. How satisfied are you all with what, where you've arrived and uh, what is the excitement level as you come out with every, every month with an issue that does in, in the include a lot of uh, literary nonfiction? Of course, by the time we come out every month, we are tired more than excited, but uh, <laughs> the excitement is there later when you look back at the magazine. We've come a fair way, but I, I don't think that we could ever use the term satisfied, uh, because, uh, I mean, the number of people who can do long form for the reasons I think both Rabi and Matt have already said is limited. Uh, there are problems here in India or the subcontinent which we uh, wrestle with uh, there is a whole issue I think this may be uh, familiar to you in Himal as well that uh, the kind of people who largely can do long form and since in caravan we are writing for an Indian audience uh, primarily and then everywhere else uh, it requires an approach which may be a little different from writing for an audience that is removed from what we are writing about mm -hmm. uh, the people who are good writers today certainly in this generation that I tend to see and I don't want to go on about in my generation it was this way or that way but it, they are people with a certain metropolitan background okay. they have gone abroad to study come back they know the literary techniques the skills mm. but uh, the knowledge of the country is sometimes limited we perennially run the danger of sort of a orientalism that is generated by ourselves rather than an orientalism from outside because for a lot of these young writers there is a feeling my god this is something we haven't seen before while for the rest of the country it is commonplace mm. um, that's one fact the second is i think the point that we are talking about we keep using the word literary and i just want to dwell on it a little bit that uh, in one way literary nonfiction has actually become very tied down to very uh, conventional understanding of the word literary. I mean, in fiction, nobody would expect that literary would mean that you write only in a certain kind of way. For example, if Kapushinsky, if we didn't know it was him, but today to submit those pieces in that format to any good magazine across the world, 
I think you would be very severely edited before it goes to print. And that would be a problem. He'd be told, what are these discontinuities? What are these jumps? What are these illusions? Uh, illusions? Is anybody be going to be able to read this? So I think we've already arrived at a new normal, and it may be time that people should be asking questions of that as well. OK. I, I think uh, the point you made about the people who have the grip, and of course we're talking about the English language, the grip of the literary uh, tropes, if you will, uh, or the literary techniques, they may not have the, the knowledge of society. Whereas, then that begs the question whether we should not somehow try and promote Alek uh, Patrakarita, long form, non fiction journalism, in the vernacular. Because if the idea is to bring about change, then we must make this jump from English into the various languages. I mean, I might be speaking too soon here. Maybe in Tamil or in uh, um, Malayalam or in um, Uriya, it is happening, or in Bangla. But I don't get a sense. Maybe in Bangla it is. Any sense from any of you, whether from Afghanistan to Nepal to great, large India, it's happening in the, in the vernacular? To the best of my knowledge, no, I don't think so. And uh, uh, see, the question is both, yes, that we have to encourage it in the vernacular. And I'm not saying that just because of the reasons I mentioned that English will limit us from this doing this journalism. It's just that we have to be aware of the problems yes. that lie there. That is basically all right. that I'm trying to say. So then I guess we should go into the economics of it. Um, the economics and I'll, <laughs> since you, you, you gave a grin there, please uh, respond to the economics of doing this sort of journalism as Caravan is right in the middle of it all. Well, I mean, it's become a cliche and we hear it all the time, but it's true, you know, I mean, if readers want long form, they want, they should be able to pay for it. And uh, especially even compared to the West, mm. I don't know if it is true in Nepal, India is one of the most spoiled media markets in the world. The cost of newspapers is among the lowest anywhere in the world. People shell out I mean, even as compared to Pakistan and India, you're paying maybe 10 or 20 percent of the price for a yeah. newspaper because yeah. it's uh, the advertising is very heavy. People are not willing to invest in uh, newspapers, magazines, long form. Uh, they would want to read it. They may turn to the net where they expect it free. Uh, under these circumstances, it is always going to be a challenge. And I don't think that anybody from within the industry can change this because yeah. this is a problem that is out there. We, we, we are not going to change society just so that long form is read. Right. So I, I can see there is a problem there because the, the corporate media is not going to go towards having a side product that uh, while you make your money off the dailies, uh, vernacular and English, to have a in your stable, a publication that does that. Uh, does the Hindu have it? No, I mean, there is Frontline, which may do one or two pieces. Uh, but I think uh, I have my criticisms of Frontline, not in terms of uh, the kind of stories they attempt, but how they attempt it. And that is a problem. You can do long form that is boring. And that, that puts the whole question of uh, everybody else doing long form in danger, because they are saying, oh, God, who's going to read these 7,500 words which just go on and on? And I mean, all of us can be sometimes responsible for that. <laughs> well, Frontline is, let us say, it is heroic. There's no doubt about it. But I'm sure, uh, like all of us in journalism, all of like like each of our publications, Frontline could also be, on occasion, better edited. I think we could get away by saying that much. Um, <laughs> um, internet. We, we are talking about w the, ad the advent of cyber journalism. What does it do to journalism? In any case, uh, that's a question. But how about what does it do to long form? Because I'd like to recall uh, a talk at the last Himal Conversations where Amit Takal, uh, who uh, is editor of the Seto Party, which is the, uh, has risen up as a rather successful uh, journalistic endeavor on the net, primarily in Nepali but also in English, he was saying that the, the l biggest hits he got were for his longest articles. So it seems that the internet uh, may not only uh, point us in the direction of short form, but it may actually be the portal for long form. Matthew. 
Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, we're seeing something interesting that's happening now, um, at least at least in uh, English language or Western media, which is that despite all the continuing dire news about uh, the journalism industry, long form is having probably one of its greatest moments ever. And oh. there's all sorts of new places, m online only places, that have started up that are paying top dollar to writers to write long for them, for them like BuzzFeed, for example, um, vo Vocative, uh, Medium has a new place called Matter, which I recently wrote a long form article from Syria uh, for them, um, Guardian, I already mentioned. So there's, there's all these new places, and the old places are actually still doing fairly well. They haven't hemorrhaged as badly as newspapers. Have I you been writing for these uh, online portals? Uh, some of them, a couple of them I have, yeah. And you're getting paid? They are paying as well as, as GQ or Rolling Stone would pay me. The, be the, the best ones are, yeah. So what is the economics that allows them to pay uh, Hartosh or uh, Ravi? And why are we not there yet? Uh, what's, what's, what's it that BuzzFeed has got that we don't got? Well, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out because... <laughs> Millions of dollars. <laughs> That might be that might be the, the the simple answer, but I mean, yeah, it's it's not enough just to have the online space. It's great, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to have content to actually fill it up, mm. and uh, not just any old content, but just but good content. I mean, we we publish print and online, but our print articles are actually longer than our online articles. Our online articles tend to be more bloggish and right, more reviews, right. and that's simply because we haven't been able to commission enough long articles, mm. and that and that boils boils down again to the same old cliche question of economics yeah and uh, you know we were we, we recently translated a piece going back to the vernacular uh -huh. we recently translated a piece by uh, well we didn't translate it, we edited the translation by the center of investigative journalism and they do a lot of political kind of I wouldn't quite say long form but kind of getting there but I mean you know for us to find funding for something like that the CIJ itself doesn't fund anything that's not political yeah. or, or socio-political. So for us to fund something, say, about a lobster festival in Maine would not be possible through sources like that. So I think it comes down to the, to the same old question of economics. Could it be that uh, there is actually uh, long-form literary non-fiction happening out there? It's just that we're not calling it that and that they're being published in small pamphlets or books or booklets. It could be that we're not, uh, that some of us are setting ourselves as a up as the high priests of, you know, the new normal, as you said, yeah. and we're ignoring what's what's already out there. I mean, there are tons of literary magazines out there published yeah. in the vernacular, yeah. which are printed in small small print runs and yeah. you know distributed amongst people. But we don't, you know, somebody somebody said to me yesterday, oh, so Lalit is the first literary magazine. Well, I was like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> we're not. We're we're a bit more out there because we're online and we have a bit more presence. But it's it's totally false to say. So it it could be that there's a lot out there that a lot of people out there who can write this kind of journalism yeah. who are not being picked up by us because we all work within our limited circles at the end of the day. Back to the economics and the economics of, uh, of uh, online journalism because if it is true that in other parts it's happening and they're paying as well, uh, then um, what does it take for South Asia to get there? Where is the economic key that we need to turn? Well, I mean, Obviously, economically, we are talking very different societies. Yes. Uh, before we come to the online portal, the fact is that in the US or in the West, you could survive as somebody contributing to uh, many of the old magazines doing long-form journalism and getting paid in a way that would allow you to live a life. It, it still is not possible in India. I think yeah. Caravan does reasonably well, but that's not the kind of money that will allow a writer to actually live off his writing in this country. So as it is, that economics is good to begin with. Mm -hmm. And when we are going to get corresponding online mediums, they are going to pay much like what the magazines are paying. So you, mm -hmm. And that changes the whole game entirely because long form does require time, energy, effort. Yeah. You have to set aside three, four months of your life on a story. At the end of it, if you don't make enough that will pay even for a month that you spend on the story, then there is a real problem. And I, that will not change in India with online either. Online in India will pay exactly the kind of money that established publications are already paying because that is the economics of the Indian market. But hang on, I mean, like Flipkart. You have eBay in the West, you have Flipkart in India. Sure. It's working all right. Now Alibaba is invading India, which means that the, that category of people who are willing to pay online is 
going to accelerate is going to you know become bigger and bigger somehow th could that not be converted into income through online because in the west how is it that uh, the portals earn money is it through subscriptions or ads or what well it, it, it you know there's not one answer there's different um, if, for example there's a publication called the atavist which works out of an app for for mobile devices or tablets and actually people subscribe or pay to read long form stories and that they actually are breaking about even on that mm. though they're making the real money selling the software that they've developed in fact you find a lot of that kind of cross subsidization in the case of something like buzzfeed um which yeah. i think you know just did a round of of, of capitalization that value the company uh in, in the hundreds of millions the long form section is kind of a loss leader a way to improve the image of of their brand basically um it's the same thing with with matter and medium which is founded by the same guys who um, built Twitter, who are billionaires. Okay. So, and this is a technology company. As you mentioned before, you know, when, when we have a deluge of information online, it's very often the few pieces that stand out that, that everyone reads and talks about and that okay. brings your, your magazine, your publication um, into the public sphere of debate. And so that's, that's, I think, often, even though companies won't make money um, by, you know, off the piece, it doesn't, it's not necessarily going to correspond to advertising space that funds it as part of an overall project, an overall publication, an overall business, it does make sense to spend money on long form, which is expensive. Okay. Anything to add to that? Well, yeah, I mean, see, there is a difference in attitude that BuzzFeed thinks it adds value to the image of the company. But you know, what is our equivalent of the New York Times, the Times of India? Can you imagine a company in the media space in India thinking that uh, you're going to do something that is not profitable but something that actually adds to the image of the brand. The problem then is an issue other than economics. It's how we perceive this business, how it is perceived by the audience and if there is anybody out there willing to pay for that. In that sense, I think we are a little different from the West. We haven't got there and there, uh, the question for existing brands will be how do you survive and make do till the time we are lucky enough to make a transition where the money is there for such things. But isn't that, isn't that the case of the, car of the caravan in Delhi Press? That, that the caravan is a sort of a loss leader for Delhi Press as a whole, right? No, no, absolutely. So uh, all I'm saying is that uh, we'll have to then wait till one generation of the Times of India suddenly wakes up <laughs> and feels that what is happening at the Times of India is not good or needs to right. be added to. Right. Th this is not part of... Uh, I think it is Anand's individual feeling that resulted in this. This is an oddity in the marketplace that is the Indian media. It, while in the West, what BuzzFeed is thinking is the norm. It is the way of thinking because it makes sense in terms of brands. I Here, think, uh, here's what I would suggest. That in the West, things have evolved far enough that the robber, robbers have become robber barons. Whereas with us, the robbers are as yet robbers. And so we, they have not evolved enough. Uh, and as you said, um, Anand, who is the editor of Caravan, is an aberration. So one formula seems to be that uh, perhaps there should be some, uh, some guy or gal with very deep pockets who decides that for the sake of my personal brand and for the sake of the brand of my company, I will invest in this. And I will get roundabout satisfaction. Am I right? For now? Yeah, but that's the case in the West too. I mean, Harper's Magazine is uh, funded at a loss each year by Rick MacArthur, who's a, who's a billionaire, right? And that's uh -huh. one of the most respected literary nonfiction magazines in, in So do we ask um, um, money to... So, uh, so it may be a cultural thing. Maybe Lalit needs to be bought up by, by Ansel. Uh -huh. <laughs> find, a, find a billionaire. <laughs> may, may, may that voice go out there to the organizers uh, to pass on to, the, to Ansel people. Uh, I, we have uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, questions uh, that uh, you may have or comments, very quick, very brief, uh, uh, because I want to take as many as, as I can in 10 minutes. Usha, over here. Uh, I'm Usha. Switch. I'm Usha Tirtikshu. Sadly, I'm an independent photojournalist. Uh, hearing you, uh, my question or comments is like, when you, when we talk about long-term photojournalism and how you deal with long-term photojournalism in Deftara Petting, not only in Nepal, but in South Asia. That's an interesting point uh, because 
we're talking about magazines and magazines also uh, emphasize photography so l to use the term long form journalism to long form photo uh, just uh, what is your experience with uh, doing the photographic equivalent of long form journalism i think the same thing we we do publish a uh, great deal of photo journalism in caravan but what you're saying the unfortunate truth is that uh, caravan itself will not be able to fund a long term photojournalism project what we do publish is work that has already been done by photojournalists who for whatever reasons have been lucky enough to afford that and that is the real problem uh, again mm -hmm. that may not be true in the west there are organizations when can put out the money which will sustain a person through the, such a project we yet don't have the means i think the larger issue of economics hits the photojournalist harder uh, that is why uh, Usha Tidikshi is frustrated in the audience here because what the answer she got is what she knew to be the reality. Uh, any other questions or queries or comments? Yes. Okay, yes. I, I'm um, uh, making this question from a reader's perspective. A long time ago, 2001, during the Royal Massacre, Himal Khabar Patrika, Nepali version, uh, carried a long form with a cover headline called Sanak Ki Banak. I would consider that a long form, very, very objective, very, very, you know, subjective as well as objective. Uh, that, uh, as in a case of, let's say, you know, Arundhati Roy running an article in Outlook, th 35 pages on the Indian Maoist issue. Uh, literally, I think what I felt was, from a reader's perspective, the moment you bring in this literary word to the uh, long form magazine, I feel it kills. The readers, I feel, are l looking for factual issues long form with different kind of perspective the moment you bring in this literary you know perspective into these journalistic uh, ideas i feel kills the whole issue that's my comment yeah uh, I, would, I would disagree completely actually because uh, as, as matthew said earlier if you have something which is i mean you may just be looking you may be looking for facts as well but if you have to read through 30 100 pages of you know just facts for me it's very boring and I think readers are not looking for, my experience is that readers do enjoy longer reads. Whether they're willing to pay for it is a completely different question. But uh, I think the literary thing is not, it's not just about adding a bit of entertainment or spice. It's about, it's about, as Matthew said again, you know, giving us a better understanding of those particular worlds in which the stories took place. So we're, so, so we're not, not just reading a timeline or a chronology of, of events, we're actually reading about, we're trying to understand why certain things might have happened and how certain things certain people might have behave, behaved in certain ways. Hartos, let's go back to Arundhati Roy, whose piece seems to have been uh, uh, seminal in the sense that some people liked it violently, others disliked it violently. Um, where do you put that particular piece on her foray into Dantewada, in the spectrum of journalism, long form or otherwise? Uh, I think uh, certainly literary provocation is I think an old established tradition. I think it generates attention to certain issues. Uh, I think that is true of everything Arundhati does. There is either strong disagreement or agreement. She did a piece for us recently this year where she analyzed the interaction between Ambedkar and Gandhi. It was again a form of literary provocation. It was extremely opinionated. It was many of the things that she writes a lot of us may disagree with. We can even talk about methodology, we can talk about facts, all these issues are important and I think that criticism does get leveled to some of her pieces. Okay. But even so, I think these are very necessary pieces. I mean, the Dantewada piece, I was very critical of, I had strong objections to, but that doesn't mean that it does not direct attention to something that's very important. I, I think there's also, there's many readers, there's not one readership. So some people, like yourself, may be more interested in just the facts reporting. Other people want to read um, about lobster festivals in Maine, or something very literary. And if you look at, at in, 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 in the US, there is actually a, a diverse range. I know what you're talking about when you say that one voice of literary uh, nonfiction journalism, that is a New Yorker voice that can get a bit monotonous or certainly doesn't admit other kinds of techniques. But you know, if you read something like GQ or um, The New Republic these days, or uh, certainly, some of these online ventures. There are is a wider range of styles and techniques that for for different readers. Uh, the title of this session is "Long Form in an Age of a Time of Short Attention Spans." I'm just wondering, given that this is the age of 
Twitter or Facebook posts, do you think the space for long-form journalism is actually increasing as a counter to the short uh, postings, or do you think it will is it being driven out? I think I'll pass. I'll ask whoever wa wants to pick that question. I would respond from my side quickly that I think the reference I made to what Amit Nakal said regarding uh, Seto Party, I'm sure that uh, that would apply to other online portals as well if there were long articles. And I would also throw the question back to you, Anoita. How do you find uh, readership in the Himal website given that there are short attention spans? But how, how are you faring yourself? I'll give the question. <laughs> I'd rather tell you in our editorial meeting, uh, but I think that the deluge of information in the short form is drowning people. And I think uh, that our hope, and which is why I work with him all, is our hope is that people are going to turn to long form and quality as a way out of the deluge. Okay. But it's not fair to make me answer that. <laughs> Good. Now the question goes back here. Uh, I, I think actually something like Twitter is a great aid. What can become problematic occasionally is that people may not turn to a long form magazine month after month. But Twitter has the ability to take individual pieces and put them out there. So your readership for long form is actually increasing because certain pieces get picked up, put out there, and the very fact that some people are interested in it makes other people interested in it. So you're no longer tied down by a journal, a magazine, which may carry a certain burden of expectation, but people are reacting to individual pieces. That's the amazing thing about social media is that it actually creates a new readership around every piece. And you know, 50%, for example, of, of the New York Times readers' clicks, you know, views on, on, on their website don't come through the front page. Someone doesn't type in New York, nytimes.com and then click on an article they like. They find it on Twitter, they find it on Facebook. So for different pieces, a completely different readership can coalesce around them, and, and it's a fascinating phenomenon. Eura, we'll take one, uh, well, maximum two. How's it? Hello. I'm John Sa. One dispute here was about amalgamation of journalism and literature. Why Ma it cannot be separated? Mike Naji get ahead of us. And purity cannot be followed upon. Thank you. That's nice comment. Thank you. Purity cannot be followed. I think it's a uh, One last question. Again, just a follow up. Uh, there's this uh, new website that I see in India, maybe this is directed to Harto Singh, called scroll.in. How do they manage, uh, you know, this between long form and short form, but brilliant. Uh, it does expansive story of daily uh, e events that happens. How do they manage? Uh, long form, uh, uh, scroll is uh, launched by a person called Samir Patel, who had actually taken the Amar Chitra Katha comics and turned them around. It's a very interesting experiment. But the question is, at the moment, Will it reach the revenue model? Uh, and I think it is a very interesting test case. He has raised enough money to make it possible. There has been a tie-up with Omidyar in the US, which is putting in a lot of money into scroll. So that means they can at least think long, terms, uh, long term in terms of expectation of revenue. That changes the way you plan, the way you think. So I think it, scroll may be the one great test case to mm. see what happens, actually. OK. I think that we will now come to the conclusion. Uh, I'll just I take three or four points away from this conversation. Uh, each of us will take us take what we will. One is we need to add skills uh, of literary presentation uh, as much as a story or a report reportage requires. Number two is we need money. Because uh, long form nonfiction, literary nonfiction requires time, effort, survival. So we need to find the economics to change, uh, to allow it to happen, rather than always looking for a sugar daddy publisher who will do it for his or her own interests of glamour or uh, position in society. Three is perhaps online gives us a way out because it doesn't have the cost of production and distribution. We talked about scroll just now. And uh, so
So perhaps online with the example of BuzzFeed and others in other societies with the increasing uh, commercialization of the, of the web within South Asia, perhaps we can aim for that. And finally, Nepali ma bhannu parda khari, Nepal bhitra pani hami le leapfrog garni, bhyagute ko uprai. Garna sangni sambhavana chaki chai na. Hami le jai le pani onnetra ko udharan hera ra, ani khari hami pani tiya pugola kunai din bhannu ko saato. Jasari ye unicode devanagiri ayara dhere kura agari bade Nepali patra gari dama. Tiasai gari ka na, the evolution of the economics perhaps means that we can also use online and uh, arrive at a world of Alek Patrakarita that we never thought today in um, October of 2000, September of 2014 was possible. Maybe a couple of years from now we'll be finding that the whole new world that we ourselves have been part of, the world of long-form journalism. I thank Matthew, Ravi and Hartosh and thank the audience for being so good here with us. See me to why not? First class to Nisani. Hello, sir. 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 H